for joining us on Give Cheese a Chance, where I encourage you to make cheese at home. I'm Marianne. Today, we're doing another episode of Cheese Chat, where I'm going to be interviewing Meryl Winstein, who is a cheese-making cookbook author. Thanks so much for joining me, Meryl. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So today, we're going to talk about starter cultures, which are really important in cheese making. So tell me, what are starter cultures and where do they come from? That's a really good question. Starter cultures are natural, harmless lactic bacteria that dwell in milk. They come from the air, they come from your hands, they come from the skin of the udder of the animal. They sometimes come from the utensils you're using, because if you're using wooden utensils, starter cultures are living in the actual wood. Okay. Starter cultures have about four main purposes. They eat lactose, they create acid, they multiply, and they are, since they're alive, they are full of body chemicals or enzymes. And after the cheese is made and pressed, the starter cultures begin to die off and then the enzymes are left in the cheese and the enzymes cut the long tough proteins into tiny flavor particles and those are the flavors you will taste. Why do some recipes ask for mesophilic starter cultures and others ask for thermophilic starter cultures? Some bacteria are more active at a lower temperature or medium temperature. Those are called mesophilic and some are active at a higher temperature. Those are called thermophilic. So for mesophilic cheese, more mesophilic bacteria, they are most active at uh, 85F or 30C, but they are active from about 50F or 10C up to about 103, uh, 39C. If it gets hotter than that, then the mesophilic or medium temperature bacteria, they'll start to die. Okay. And when they're, would I say, more active, they eat lactose faster, they make acid faster, they multiply faster, so they're creating their enzymes faster at a temperature of about 85F or 30C. So that would be mesophilic bacteria. So certain cheeses are made at medium temperatures like that. That's the kind of bacteria that's most responsible for creating the flavors in those cheeses. And then thermophilic bacteria are like the bacteria that's uh, useful in yogurt. Thermophilic bacteria like higher temperatures. They're active from 95 up to, well, yeah, from about 95 even up to 130 or 140, but they're the most active from 95 to 113F. That means that at those higher temperatures they eat lactose faster, they create acid faster, they multiply faster, and very importantly, at those higher temperatures, they're multiplying and they're creating their enzymes of ripening that will later on cut the long proteins into tiny flavor particles to create your actual flavor that you taste. So yogurt's an example of a cheese product that's made at a higher temperature. The bacteria that's in there that you're using is thermophilic bacteria. Wow, so you can take the bacteria from yogurt and make cheese out of it? Yes, you can. In fact, I don't really think of yogurt as yogurt. I think of it as tubs of cheese-making starter bacteria that they carry at most supermarkets. And would that be the same for kefir? Well, that cultured kefir, the Lifeway or Trader Joe's brand, for example, uh, has a list on the back of a whole host of cheese-making starter bacteria that you could have just bought at a company, but it's all there in the uh, bottle, and I often use that for making mesophilic cheeses. So how does somebody inoculate their milk with a cultured yogurt or kefir? Oh, okay. Well, when you're using uh, like the tub of yogurt or the bottle of cultured kefir, which is just a, a bottle full of cheese starter cultures, mm -hmm. that's called bulk starter culture. So normally you add one to one and a half percent of that bulk culture to your milk. So if you're using, let's say, one liter, a thousand milliliters, you would put in uh, 10 to 15 milliliters of your bulk starter. And sometimes if you, sometimes you'll see a recipe where they'll add, say something like, add a half cup of starter. They're talking about using a bulk starter like that. And it would mean a half a cup of if, yogurt? If that's or what the you... recipe oh. called for. So you, nice could, mixture. you could use yogurt, you could use kefir to make your cheeses at home, yeah. or you can use these. So 
talk to me about these. So the ones that you buy in a packet are really intended for commercial use. They're not that concerned with what a home cheese maker wants, but I, I'm glad we can get these packets now pretty easily. When I first started making cheese, it seemed hard and confusing to get them. Well, at least with the freeze-dried packet, it's mm -hmm. very convenient. You take a small amount uh -huh. and, and the freeze-dried packet lives in your freezer for months <laughs> and years. That's right. Right. You could Until just pull out a, a, a type of bacteria at your fingertips. And you'll know that the flavor from the packet is always going to be a clean flavor that you will like. So why are some people against freeze-dried packets of bacterial starters? I think that people have a perception that their knowledge of using natural starters in the milk has somehow been stolen from them or covered up. I don't happen to agree with that. I think that we have just lost traditions and corporate knowledge of how milk works and how natural cheese making is and used to be. Mm -hmm. So over, let's say, the past 40 years, as hobbyist cheesemakers, uh, you know, more of us multiplied too, we've been using starter cultures. And then uh, some people, it's dawned on them that, wait a minute, there's a way to do this without those natural, like, you know, big starter culture company flavors, let's say. Okay. And yes, it is, but nothing's been stolen. The information has been, well, I mean, I have things in print from the early 20s. You can go back to the 18 and 1700s or earlier information. And, and all of it is documented how you would use natural starters. Now, in those days, their starter culture was a bottle of starter culture. This was 1900 or 1915 or, you know, 1890 or something like that. Okay, so we didn't have freeze drying in those days. But time marches on and more technology developed. And in some, at some point, you know, the ability to make a freeze dried version of the starters happened. And that's easier to ship and store and use actually. So what if a recipe asks for a mesophilic starter culture and it says, use a quarter teaspoon of MM100? What if you, you don't have that? Is there a way for you to know um, or understand how to make a good substitution? Yes, let's just go over. There really are only four or five basic starter cultures. Even the ones that the companies are looking for they are just sub, sub, sub variants of these four or five main starter cultures that are that eat lactose and create acid. So um, there's one that's called L. lactis, and that's a starter bacteria that creates acid pretty quickly. And there's one that's called L. cremoris, and that makes acid too, maybe a little bit more slowly. Those are combined in a mixture called MA11. So MA11 is just, or MA13 and other numbers too, is simply a mixture of lactis and cremoris. It's used for creating acid. You would use that in a cheese like cheddar, for example. That's a typical mixture. Okay, those are two. Here's a third one, L-diacetylactis. L-diacetylactis, um, it eats lactose and creates acid. It also creates medium amounts of carbon dioxide gas, which mm -hmm. tastes good. And it also creates some other flavors. Sometimes they call it buttery flavor. So if you get the mixture called MM100, that's made out of lactis for acid, cremoris for acid, and diacetylactis for giving a medium amount of carbon dioxide gas and the diacetylactis flavor or buttery flavor. Okay. okay? Then there's a fourth one called leuconostoc mesenteroids. So leuconostoc makes uh, very small pinholes of gas, of carbon dioxide gas, and also a really yummy flavor. I can't really describe it. I like it a lot. And uh, if you look at a blue cheese, you'll often see big craggy spots that are full of blue mold, but also these tiny like pinholes. Those little pinholes of gas are made by the leuconostoc bacteria. If you were to get a mixture that's called Floridanica, that is made of lactis for acid, cremoris for acid, diacetylactis for medium amounts of gas, 
and uh, keeping uh, some holes open, and then leuconostic for its tiny pinpoints of gas and its flavor too. So those are the four main types of uh, mesophilic starters. Then there's also the strep thermophilus, that's the thermophilic starter. Sometimes a name of it might be TA61 or something like that. And that's, that's in all of the um, starters for higher temperature cheeses. So there are really only five starters, the ones that are eating lactose and creating acid. Are there other organisms that we add to cheese to create other flavors? Yes, there are some of those. Um, for example, there's uh, two thermophilic or high temperature activated bacteria. One is called Helveticus. It gives a kind of sweet flavor or maybe kind of a Swiss flavor, you might say. It's often used in alpine cheeses of the high mountains in Switzerland or France. And the same with Bulgaricus. Bulgaricus also adds that kind of a flavor that you think of in, a, let's say, Comte or Gruyere. There's another one called Propionic. And if you've ever eaten the kind of cheese that has big round holes, Propionic is a bacteria and it creates a lot of carbon dioxide gas to blow up big round holes. There are also molds that you might add you would use a white mold to make uh, the outer surface of a brie or a camembert. And that white mold grows on the outside of the cheese because it needs oxygen. It creates enzymes that help to cut the proteins into tiny flavor particles and make the cheese actually so creamy and soft. That's why that kind of cheese is so soft. The proteins have been cut by the enzymes from the white molds. And then blue mold added to the cheese, that's going to grow in the into the little holes in a blue cheese, and you'll have blue cheese, and the blue cheese flavor. Mm -hmm. There are cheeses that have a pink, gooey uh, surface on the outside, and that is a bacteria called Brevibacterium linens. Which has quite a smell, I understand. Yes, it gives off a sulfury <laughs> smell, or fishy, or I like to call it a seawater. <laughs> that's a, that's a nice way of, of putting yeah. it, really, it's <laughs> like pretty that. stinky. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of times people just say stinky. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have learned a lot about <laughs> starter cultures. Thank you so much, Meryl, welcome. for teaching all of us everything you know about starters. Oh, glad to help. If you like this video, please click the like below and make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can see our cheese chat videos in the future. For Give Cheese a Chance, I'm Marianne. This is Meryl. Happy cheese making.